All right, so it's Monday, this is June 21st, oh my gosh. Hey, it's 621, 2021, look at that. I'd be more concerned if it was like month 20, the 21st on the 20th. No, that doesn't happen, we don't have 20 months. Anyway, we are going to talk about the shoulder complex and we're in kinesiology, we're gonna divide the shoulder up. So we're gonna have the shoulder complex and then we're gonna have the shoulder. The shoulder is the true glenohumeral joint. So where the, the, you know, the humeral head goes into the glenoid fossa. The shoulder complex is everything else around the shoulder. We're gonna cover them separately because they both have different things that can cause problems. The pathologies typically go along with both of them. And we're gonna have a few of those today. But for the most part, the shoulder complex is what's gonna build the structure of the shoulder. So looking at the overall joint of this and the structure of the, the what, I, what I tend to call the shoulder complex, right? We have our clavicle, we have our scapula. And the other thing that a lot of people forget about is our rib cage. Primarily rib two and rib seven are the main areas of articulation with the scapula itself because of the shape of the scapula, right? The scapula you saw is kind of almost like a C shape, right? C is for cookie, it's good enough for me. And so down here at the inferior angle, right, you have a little bit of articulation with the seventh. And up here towards the top, you have an articulation where it kind of wraps around the second rib. That doesn't mean that through that, you don't have articulations with the rest of the ribs. It's more of a syndemosis joint through the rest of it. But there is a little bit of bony articulation in those two kind of major points. And you know, I want to hit this again. Remember, if your boards ask you, what is the most fractured bone in the human body? What is the most fractured bone in the human body? Clavicle. Clavicle, good, right? Then if they say, what is the most fractured bone in falls under 65, it's the what? Skateboard, good. And then over 65, it's the? Hip. Hip, good, right, the femur. And we actually just had... Um, one of the students from the other cohort was actually just talked to me. Her, unfortunately, her grandfather fell. And he ended up with a surgical neck fracture of the, the, the femur. So I was like, hey, we just learned about that in the other class. So, and again, the main reason that clavicle is so easy to fracture is just because it's not a lot of meat, right? There's just not much there. Um, I want to say... It's like, Aaron Rodgers has fractured that clavicle, I think, three times now on one side. So his clavicle is good and sturdy now. He's not going to have any problems as he gets older. So with the scapula, all of these bony landmarks that I have here, you should be able to locate. And why I say this is especially for those of you that are going out on your clinicals right now for uh, outpatient. I, and I, feel you talked, I talked to two of you guys on Friday. In your outpatient, if you're going to an outpatient clinic, the two main things you're going to see, although they say post-surgical hips, post-surgical knees, the two main things you're going to see in the outpatient clinic are lumbago, which is low back pain, and shoulder issues. Because just tons of people come in for shoulder issues, whether it's frozen shoulder, whether it's a slap repair or something to that effect. So you need to get really good at locating those bony landmarks. Now, the good news is you did most of this. Lumbago, yes, lumbago is exactly like you just spelled it. Lumbago means low back pain. The other term is lumbalgia. Also means low back pain. I don't know why we have multiple terms for it. I don't know why we just don't say the abbreviation for it is LBP, low back pain. But a lot of times when it comes over, and mainly because of the... Uh, ICD-10 codes, which are the billing codes that come over from Medicare and all the insurances, it has it broken into lumbago. I, I, that's what insurances call it. Uh, most of us in the clinic call it low back pain or LBP. So, but understand if you see in the chart that says patient has lumbago, that's fancy insurance talk for back pain, right? Um, you know, if they have like thoracalgia, thorac right? So, That's upper or mid back pain, right? And then obviously cervicalgia is neck pain. So nothing ever is easy. I'm just saying. 
They never make it easy just to like, hey, it's neck pain. Oh, hey, it's mid back pain. No, they've got to come up with fancy terms for it and put all kinds of codes on it. There's mean to us. That's all I'm saying. Um, you guys don't have to necessarily know all the ICD-10 codes. We'll actually talk about that in fifth semester, but that's kind of the ICD-10 is, you know, if you go to the doctor right now and Truman goes to the doctor and he's sick and he's got the flu, when the doctor sends the bill, his bill over to the insurance, he picks what's called an ICD-10 code, you know, International Classification of Disease, 10th edition code that says, I saw Truman for the flu or I saw him for COVID, or I saw him for strep throat. There's a specific ICD-10 code for all of those. So kind of getting back to the shoulder here, right? So we've got our, our very common scapula here, right? Or in layman's terms, that shoulder blade. We have our superior angle, right? Our superior angle is going to be on our medial or vertebral border, right? Our inferior angles down here. We have our vertebral or medial border here. We have our axillary border, which is the border along the what? When I say axilla, that means armpit, good, right? So that axilla or the axillary border. We have the spine, which is that nice part that you can actually reach back and kind of get a hold of on your scapula, right? That's that kind of bar that goes across, as I call it. And then on the front, we have the coracoid and the acromion process, right? Those are the two main points up here on the front of your scapula. And then you have the glenoid fossa, which is where the humeral head's eventually going to sit. Most of those, with the exception of obviously glenoid fossa, you can't exactly get in and palpate that. That doesn't work that way. Um, you know, you can palpate almost all of those in some way, shape, or form. Now, the, board, the, the actual scapula itself has multiple fossas, right? Because we've got the glenoid fossa here. We've got fossa underneath. So this is the anterior side or the underneath side of it, right? With the, which fossa is that? That's the sub... Subscapulars. Good, subscap, right? We have up here, which is our suprascap fossa, right? And then we have down here, what's underneath the spine is the? Infra. Infra, right, spinatus fossa, good. All of those are just places for what to hide? What hides in those? Muscles. Muscles, yeah, that's all it is, right? So when you have the fossas, they're really just little cavities where muscles can hide, right? That's just like when we have the tuberosities, tubercles, and trochanters, they're just attachment points for muscles. So that's kind of the idea of the scapula. And then we get the part where, of course, obviously, eventually the clavicle is going to articulate with this. And then we've got the clavicle, which is the next bone, right? We have a sternal end. And usually when I'm looking at the clavicle, when I want to find the sternal end, I look for the flat end. Because the sternal end is a little bit flatter. You know, just like the earth, it's nice and flat. Oh, wait, no, that's not the way it works. The earth is more like the acromial end because it's rounded. The other thing is you have that little notch out there, that little kind of bump. That kind of clues you in that if you find that bump, you've got the acromial end, right? And the acromium has this little bitty thing called the acromial hook here as well. And then, of course, the body is the main part of it. And then the other bone that we have that kind of articulates here with the sternal end of the clavicle is the sternum, right? We have our manubrium, right? Does anyone know what manubrium means? It's like the top of the tie. Okay, right? yep, the, the right. Where did the, do you know where it comes from? I think it's like, is it like a, something with a knife handle or something? I don't know. Close. You're, you're on the right thought process. It is to, to deal with combat. Manubria is the, I think it's Latin for shield. And if you look at the top of your, well, your, ster your sternum here, it kind of looks like a shield, right? And honestly, when you do a tie up there as well, right, the numerical knot is kind of shield-like as well. It protects kind of your throat area. And then we got the body, which is the big portion of it. 
And then we got my favorite part down here, the siphoid process. I don't know why that's my favorite part of the sternum, but it, I just think the X, we don't have a lot of, that's okay. That's why I asked. The xiphoid is one of my favorite parts just because it's one of the few bones in the human body that starts with X. So I just like that it's a xiphoid. Um, when, so when in healthcare can this xiphoid process become a problem for us? Does anyone know? Is it CPR? Good, CPR. And then one other case, what, what other life-saving method do we do? A uh, Heimlich maneuver? Yes, right, the abdominal thrust, good. Because you gotta make sure that when you're doing that abdominal thrust, you find that xiphoid process and go below it. Because that xiphoid process is really fine. And it's really easy if you put that abdominal thrust in there, or if you're doing CPR incorrectly, that you can snap that xiphoid process off and send it right into the spleen. And if you send it into the spleen, is that gonna be a good day for the patient? No, right? That's a called a splenic lack or a splenic laceration, and they bleed out quick. So that's why you want to come down when you're doing that. Okay, there's my sci-fi process, right? It's a little tender. And then I definitely want to come down a full fist width below. Or if I'm doing compressions, I want to make sure that I'm lateral to that sternum when I'm doing those compressions. Now, what happens if it just happens? Um, well, you know, if you save the patient's life, then you save the patient's life. Right, but just be aware that you gotta be kind of careful there. And they're really specific about that when you're doing CPR. Um, again, in the martial arts, that is a major target right there. Cause sitting right below it is a little hole. Does anyone know what we call that little hole that's right below it? Cause some of you probably have been hit there before. It's called the solar plexus. Has anyone heard that term before? Yeah, I watch yeah. a lot of UFC and they say it all the time. Yeah, so the solar plexus, just like you have your cervical plexus, your lumbar plexus, solar plexus is a plexi of nerves that kind of innervates your overall interior kind of gut, lungs and stuff like that. I'm sure some of you actually hit that at some point in sports because if you get hit there really hard, what happens to you? Yeah, there it is, Joseph. You get winded, right? It knocks the wind completely and utterly out of you because it causes the diaphragm to rapidly contract. And it just forces all that air out of your lungs, right? And that's a, that's, that sits just kind of right below that xiphoid process. And it's kind of a, a non-lethal area that we hit in the martial arts quite frequently. And again, like you said, in MMA, it's a real big target because if I can knock the wind out of a fighter and I'm still breathing, I've got an advantage. Um, but anyway, that's enough about killing people. So we have a couple joints, right? And not those joints again. Get that out of your head, Anthony. We're talking about joints of the body. So we have a sternoclavicular joint. I'm just joking. I wasn't calling you out on it, maybe a little. The sternoclavicular joint is where the sternum is going to meet up with the clavicle, right? On that sternal end of the clavicle. There's going to be a couple ligaments there. We have the anterior and posterior sternoclavicular ligament. Those are gonna be the two ligaments that kind of hold it in place. That's great, I love it. Good news is the, the chat doesn't get saved. We also have the costoclavicular ligament, which is the one that goes, whenever you see costo, you're thinking ribs, right? So costoclavicular goes down here and attaches to the ribs. And then we have the interclavicular ligament, which kind of comes like this, right? So we have a sternoclavicular here. We have a sternoclavicular in the back as well, right? Anterior and posterior. And we have the interclavicular ligament. That has a habit of tearing just because of the way it sits, especially if you fracture your clavicle. And then we have that costoclavicular ligament. All those ligaments are pretty much all that hold that little floating bone in place. Is that kind of like interosseous membrane? It is kind of like an interosseous membrane, 100%, except it, again, with interosseous membrane, it's more fibrous. So it's more of a uh, almost cartilaginous structure. Whereas this is more, it's still obviously connective tissue. This is more ligamentous than it is fibrous. But yeah, absolutely. It should be more along the lines of like the pubis symphysis type style, more almost okay. like that syndemosis. Okay. Is it stronger in this? 
Yeah, it's pretty strong. I mean, it is, it's, it's, I mean, you got to think about it. You go through life with that, those two bones basically floating in here. Yeah. That's really all they do, right? And so that interclavicular ligament there is one of the major things that kind of hold it together. So, yeah, I mean, all those are for the size of the ligaments they're trying, believe it or not, when they, again, they usually tear only if you fracture something. Mm -hmm. They're not ones that you get a lot of sprains and tears, like, you know, just abnormal tears, like an ACL tear or something like that. They're pretty potent and strong. Again, they're very short, very thick ligaments. And, and they, go ahead. Sorry, and ligament is bone to bone, right? Ligament is bone to bone, yes, okay. right? And tendon is muscle to bone. Yes, okay. Just a yep. little. Yeah. That's fine. Um, I appreciate the, if you ask that, somebody else has the same question. So again, feel free. Yeah. And we also have this caracoacromial ligament. So the caracoacromial ligament, like it says, right? Caraco going from the clavicle to the acromion. And then we end up out in the hot mess that is the lateral shoulder, right? Because once we get out kind of to that lateral shoulder, we have a caracoclavicular ligament, we have an acromioclavicular ligament, caracoacromial ligament, acromioprosal ligament. And all of that job is to hold this whole shoulder out here together. So we have a couple that hold the clavicles together in the middle. And then we have a whole almost roof of ligaments that hold that shoulder together. All of these ligaments that are out here, that are out here and that are here would be what? That would be known as the joint what? Capsule, good job, exactly, right? That's that joint capsule that's holding everything nice and snug because we can get in on that clavicle and mobilize the clavicle and stretch out those ligaments a little if they're too tight. So we would mobilize the joint at that point. We can mobilize the ribs. Uh, sternum doesn't mobilize as much because it's kind of attached to the ribs. Um, but the clavicle definitely, and if you've got somebody, because I actually have a friend that has a really super mobile left clavicle, I can get in on his clavicle and it'll move three to four inches south because that interclavicular ligament is torn. Uh, he an MMA fighter, and he had it torn in a fight. Somebody struck him there, and it literally just ripped that ligament apart. On the yeah. um, on a normal like, um, if if it's not torn, like how much movement do we do we have in terms of like two to three millimeters? Honestly, not a ton. Um, you have more room mobilizing this rib than you do moving the clavicle, if that makes sense. So this ligament here, if the ligament going between the clavicle and the rib is a little bit more lax than the other ligaments kind of holding it in place. So you don't have a ton of movement. If you do have a ton of movement, well, then you've got a little bit of a hypermobile clavicle. Is that problematic? Uh, well, I mean, if it's causing you problems, sure. If it's not, it's not a problem. When, when would we, um, when would we like mobilize that in terms Good of- Good question. So again, this is not gonna be a typical joint where we're gonna have a capsular pattern, right? Cause again, yeah. clavicle doesn't move much. But if I'm getting in here and again, so right here is my anterior deltoid or not anterior deltoid, anterior scalene. There's my middle scalene. There's my posterior scalene if I fill them in, right? So I've got this interscaling triangle here. That's where all those nerves and stuff pass out in the arm. I may actually mobilize that to stretch the scaling inferiorly. Same thing with mobilizing the rib because the scaling is going to attach a little bit to that rib. Or if I've got a really tight SCM, because think about one of those attachments for the SCM is right sternoclavicular, right? Or uh, sternocleidomastoid, right? that attaches onto the clavicle. So I can mobilize that to stretch out that SCM a little bit as well. So especially if I've got somebody that maybe I'm working on having um, torticollis that I'm not getting any response from them. Yeah, then I'm gonna come in and kind of try mobilizing that clavicle a little bit, if that makes sense. You do that more with like manual or like a mm -hmm. belt or something? Um, well, I, I tend, yeah, I, I tend to do the clavicle manually because I don't want, I don't want them like screwing up that whole joint up here at the sternum and again like literally if i you know if i'm taking this brain here and i'm putting pressure i mean it's it's literally that about that mo amount of motion you're going to get out it's not a ton but what it does is out of that tendon right remember we learned out of the tendon we've got those golgi tendon organs remember that 
Mm-hmm. And so if I can mobilize those Golgi tendon organs, sometimes I can cause the muscle to in, involuntarily relax, basically. So I'm not really mobilizing it to get more motion out of the clavicle. I'm more mobilizing it to trigger a reaction in the muscle. The muscles around it. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. And again, I'm, I'm not 100% an upper extremity specialist. I just have practiced this and I've helped somebody get ready for their uh, hand therapy exam. So trust me, I've spent way too much time looking at this stuff. I almost said a bad word. Um, I almost said a bad word. So I spent a lot of time. So Amanda says, when palpating the coracoid process, would it be a bit inferior? Absolutely. Yep. You're 100% on. Right? So just, when you're looking at that, so if I go back to the previous picture here real quick. So there we are. So if I'm looking on, kind of coming on the front side, what I'm going to do in order to find the coracoid is I'm going to find my acromion, right? So I'm going to come out here and find that tip. And for me, my tip is really sensitive. So I know where that acromion is because my, my acromion is not happy. I've got a hooked one. And then if I come just a little bit more medially and inferiorly, it's a bony, usually you can find a lot of those processes and the tubercles and tuberosities you can find because when you get on them, they're kind of sensitive, right? Because that's where the muscles attach on. But yes, absolutely. And we're going we're gonna to practice a little bit of palpation skills when we get back into class. And again, I did that wrong. You don't want to do pokey. I'm poking on myself, which is okay, right? When we do patients, big, broad hands, find it. Okay, there we go. There's that chromium. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, that's not comfortable. I found it. Most of it, other than that coracoid process. Yes, you do have to practice using your palms. Absolutely. Yeah. Most of the, the, the out of all the scapula, the coracoid process is probably the hardest thing to find. Right. And the good news is if you have your, or you all should have it, the um, trail guide the trail guide to anatomy or whatever that has literally, I, I would, if I'm taking one, if, you know, if I'm like, I don't look books I want to take with me to the clinic, that trail guide is coming with me because man, that has how to find every single little nook and cranny on the human body. If you need it, it also has some mobilization stuff in it as well. And I don't know if you guys have noticed or have looked at it, but I'm pretty confident in the current edition of the trail guide that you guys have, there's a code in the front that gives you access to the digital version of the trail guide too, which includes a bunch of videos for palpation. Don't ignore those videos and the stuff. So just saying, you guys have a lot cooler stuff than I had when I was coming up through. Back when I was old. All right, so with the actual, again, we're talking the actual shoulder complex, not the shoulder itself. What kind of motions we have? Primarily, it's gonna be scapular motions. Right? So I have elevation of the scapula, which is that scapular spine. So when I think of this, I always kind of reference it off the spine. So with elevation, my scapular spine is going up. With depression, my scapular spine is going down. So elevation, depression, elevation, depression. Now, when I elevate my scapula, I'm going to get a little bit of rotation with it as well. That just goes along with it, the way the scapula moves. But for the most part, like if I reach my hands way overhead, I'm elevating my scapula. If I reach way low, I'm gonna depress my scapula. And then we have that one that threw everybody off, that protraction and retraction, or at least threw a couple of you off, right? So remember I said protraction, kind of punching out, that is, Bringing, when I think of that one, uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking that acromial end for protraction and I'm wrapping it forward. For retraction, I'm bringing that acromial end and wrapping back, right? So when I think retraction, I think rows. For protraction, I think punches. Rows and punches. Does that help a few of you? I hope, I know it helped one of you. I remember talk, talking about that, the, talking about that the other day. And then we have upward and downward rotation. When we're talking, again, if I talk about the elevation depression being the scapular spine, upward and downward rotation deal with that acromial end. So if I upwardly rotate, the acromial end is going up towards my ear. 
if I downward rotate, the acromion lens is going to come down towards my body. Now, again, it doesn't rotate that far down, but that's the direction they're going if they're doing rotation. So if I do abduction of my shoulder, my acromion has to rotate up or otherwise I can't do that. So you can do this to yourself right now. If you take one of your hands, get a hold of your scapula in the back and lock it down. Don't let that scapula move at all. And then try to do abduction, right? I can't get anywhere or even flexion. Flexion, you're limited on how far you can go as well. Because when you're doing that, that scapula has to rotate upward or you get no motion for a few degrees, you know, 60 degrees is what we'll typically get. So I'm pulling, uh, uh, now I let go of the scapula, I can do my full range of motion. But if I lock that scapula down, I'm kind of locked into about 60 degrees. And then there is tilt. So tilt goes, when we're talking about tilt, it usually goes along with protraction and retraction. It's just an anterior posterior tilt of the spine. And it mainly comes in, you would see scaption. You know, we're going to talk about scaption when we get to the actual true shoulder joint. We're going to talk about what scaption really is. Um, primarily, when we think scaption, right? Here I'm in what plane? Shoulder flexion is in the which plane? Sagittal. Sagittal, right? Sagittal. Abduction is in the frontal. What they call the, the scapular or the scaption plane is a 45 between them. Yep, you're exactly right, Joe. So it's kind of out here. So we'll talk about that because we'll talk about some special tests we do in the scapular plane. Open can. You're exact. Look at that. Open and closed cans. What I was mentioning with tilt is normally in a normal human body, if I lay my palms on your scapula, there's very little kind of anterior and posterior tilt going on. And this is not protraction and retraction. This is literally like rocking up and down. But some people, and I've got some great pictures of it, will get a weird problem where their inferior angle tilts way out. And that's called scapular winging. And I've got a great picture of scapular winging coming up that should make some of you vomit. I'm just joking. It shouldn't. It's kind of gross, though. I'll blame it at that. So when I've got scapula humeral rhythm, this is where the scapula and the humerus work together to get motion. And this occurs with both shoulder flexion and shoulder abduction primarily. Although there is some hum scapula humeral rhythm with other motions as well, the two main ones you need to know for your boards are flexion and abduction. What this says is if I do shoulder flexion, the very first 30 degrees is pure glenohumeral movement. So that's literally just that humeral head moving in the glenoid fossa. So the first 30 degrees, well, also I said also abduction as well. So out here and here, whenever I have to upward rotate the scapula. So the first 30 degrees when I'm doing that here, right? So this first 30, is just the humeral head moving, or out here. Out here is a little easier to demonstrate. So those first 30 degrees, so about there. Once I get past this 30 degrees, for every two degrees I go up with my humeral head, my scapula tilts up by one degree. So there's a two to one ratio. So for every degree that my arm goes, every two degrees that my arm goes up, that goes up by one degree. Does that make sense? At least the math of it. Um, no. No, it's, it's okay. Nope, that's okay. That, uh, that's why I want to cover it, because I want to make sure that we get this. Um, don't have, I should have brought a shoulder home. My shoulder knew this. Just kidding. Um, so what it's saying, let's see what I got here. What can I make a shoulder out of? So what it's saying, uh, that's not a good scapula. Use my phone as a scapula here. 
So if this flashlight is my humerus coming up into abduction or coming up into flexion, whichever way I'm going, the very first 30 degrees is just motion in that fossa. Does everyone understand that part of it at least? Yes. Okay. Once I hit 30, yeah, there's a good scapular humor. That was actually going to link that. So thank you, Joe. You're ahead of me. Once you're past that 30 degrees, for every two degrees I go up, the scapula has to rotate one degree. So two degrees, one degree, two degrees, one degree, two degrees, one degree, two degrees, one degree until I reach my full 180. Makes sense. Makes sense sort of, right? At least a little. So if my first 30 degrees of shoulder flexion is just pure glenohumeral rhythm, right? Pure GH rhythm. That means my remaining 150 degrees, we haven't covered the shoulder yet, but there's 180 degrees of shoulder flexion, 180 degrees of abduction. That means 150 of it is going to be this scapula humeral rhythm. So if, yep, that's what I'm, I, I'm getting there to do that right now. Brooke, you're, oh my gosh, you guys are just in my head. I just wanted to hit this real quick first. So that means if I move 150 degrees up, how many degrees? of motion does my scapula have to upwardly rotate? If my humeral head moves 150, getting all kinds of math here, a two to one ratio would be half. Does that make sense? There we go, Joe's got it, 75. Remember, it's only this last 150 degrees. So again, I go up by two degrees on the shoulder, that scapula goes up by one degree. So the 150 plus the 30 would be 180 total, yes. But in this first 30, there's no scapular movement at all. So it's just that humeral head rotating. I know I lost Brooke at some point here with the math. Where did the 30 come in? Yep, so that's what I'm gonna hit. So remember the first 30 degrees of shoulder motion, uh -huh. either flexion or abduction, is just that humeral head here moving, kind of rolling. That's all it's doing. Okay, but we do we add that to the 150? Well, yeah, when we're, if we talk about full shoulder motion, yes, right? So we'd have a full shoulder motion of 180. And then is that when we would divide it in half to get the full um, scapular motion? I'm actually giving you the test question right now. That's what I'm getting to. So Daniel asked about it. I'm going to I'm gonna get that. So what the way a test question would be worded about this, because that might help clear it up a little bit. The way a test question... The first 30 degrees is just in the glenohumeral fossa. Exactly, Amanda. It's just, it's literally just that humerus kind of rotating in that fossa. There's no, so that scapula doesn't have to move at all. So a test question would be something like this. It would say that your patient um, has 120 degrees of total shoulder flexion motion. How many degrees of upward rotation is the scapula able to achieve? Well, hold on there, Brooke. You, so we got to, first of all, so what they're going to do is they're going to go down here and it's going to go um, So those are going to be your choices. So what you first so that's the question. We got at least we got the question down. So you have to go okay, so he's got a total of 120, right? That's, that was the, the key thing. He's got a total of 120. We got to subtract the 30 out first. Good. Okay, so I've got a couple 45s going on. 
So we got to subtract that 30 out because all that is is the humeral head in the fossa. There's no scapular motion going on at that point. So when I'm going here, that first 30 degrees, there's nothing going on. And actually, if I lock my scapula down really hard, I can go out there pretty easily. Once I get there, I keep hitting a bony block because what's happening is my humeral head's banging off the roof of my scapula and saying, I can't go anywhere. I can't go anywhere because my scapula is sitting like this, right? So what has to happen when I go past that, so there's my 30 degrees. In order to go past that, I have to have a motion that coincides. So they have to work together to rotate up. So if I take that first 30 degrees out, It means my heat, I get about 90 degrees of other motion past that 30. So out here, if I get 30, I've got another 90 going up. That means my scapula has to rotate up half of that. So that would be 45. They're not going to make you do it. They're not going to say like 43.2 degrees or anything like that. It's literally going to be this easy of math when you do it. So let's just do another so that we're clear as mud. So let's go with, no, oh, green's not gonna work on a green background. Good job, Mr. McKeever. Let's go, no, where's white? White will show up. So, it's not gonna show up when I'm typing. Good job. Mr. McKeever? Yep. Just a quick question, so I don't have it like stuck in my head this way. Are you always going to subtract that 30 degrees? In that case, yes. Why just in that case? Well, if it's asking you about scapular rotation, if we're just measuring to total shoulder flexion, we don't care about the scapula, really. Like okay. if I tell you, measure John's shoulder flexion, I'm just asking you for his total range of motion. I'm not, you know, so you're going to measure him through his total shoulder range of motion. I don't care. I would say total motion at that point. Exactly, John, right? If I say, okay, measure his total motion and then tell me how much his scapula moves, then you would have to subtract that 30 out, divide that range by half, and that'll tell you how much his scapula moves. Does that make sense? Okay, so the difference is between like the motion versus like the whole range of motion. Right, versus the whole range of motion versus just the scapular motion. Okay, so just pay attention when it says scapular Yes. So like here, I'm going to say patient is limited to, uh, let's go 30 degrees of scapular upward rotation. The total motion of the shoulder flexion would be what? So it would come down here and be like 180 degrees, 60 degrees, 90 degrees, 120 degrees. Okay, so I see a couple 60s and I see a couple 90s. So again, I asked about the toe, that's okay. That's why we're going over this. Oh, uh, man, it's like, oh, 90, it just hit her. Because what do you have to do? Double, then add the 30. There we go. Right, exactly. So we know that if I'm limited to 30 degrees of scapular upward rotation, I've got 60 total degrees extra of flexion, right? But I've got that first 30 that doesn't even count in. Right, so there's, when I'm talking about scapular upward rotation, it doesn't matter. Right, you need to add it back in once we figure out how much weight. So we know that if the scapula moves up 30, the humerus, yes, right? The humerus is gonna move 60. And then you have that original 30 that the scapula didn't move. So 60 plus 30, the answer would be 90 here. So our gold answer here would be 90. Now, I didn't do this like the boards would do this. I was kind of trying to trick you, I tried to trick you a little bit out. The boards would have put 60 as the first answer because you'd have gone, well, I got 30 degrees times 260. That's my first answer. You have to think a little bit. We will hit this more. Don't worry. This is not the only last time we're going to talk about this. 
right? But what it is literally saying again, with either flexion or abduction, the first 30 degrees is just my humeral head in my glenoid fossa, right? If I actually come here, I can put my hand up on my scapula and my scapula is not moving at all. Once I get past 30, for every two degrees I go up, the scapula goes up one degree. So I get all the way to the top if I've got a full range of motion. That's okay, Brooke, that's why I'm gonna cover it again. I understand, this, is, this concept is a difficult one. The other thing your boards they just ask you, and you may get lucky because a couple have got this, it's the math, right? The boards may just ask you, what is the scapula humeral rhythm? And for that, you just have to know it's two to one. That's it. You don't have to do any math. You just have to know it's two to one, right? So this is saying for every two degrees, the humerus moves. The scapula moves one. Outside of that first 30 degrees. So for every two degrees, the humerus goes up. That scapula has to move with it. Otherwise, you're locked, right? And now let's say I have something like a frozen shoulder. Part of my problem oftentimes in frozen shoulder is scapula humeral rhythm, where that scapula just is not upward rotating. Why do you think the scapula might not upwardly rotate? I know who knew that it had word problems, right? Why do you think, what would, give me some ideas or thought process why that scapula would not upwardly rotate like it's supposed to. What could cause that? Tight, Got muscles. Caps. Tight muscles, good, right? Maybe my lower traps are super tight. That would be a capsular pattern. You're exactly right, Diana. That would be a capsular pattern, right? But maybe it's tight muscle down here. Maybe it might be a tight superior capsule. Maybe it might be a weak levator and levator's not helping it upwardly rotate or upper trap. Maybe it's a combination of all those. And most of the time, guess what, Anthony? It's a little bit of all of it. Or the other thing that we forget about is maybe it's because the scapula is stuck to the ribs. So for whatever reason, here's my scapula, here's my ribs, it kind of formed a suction cup to it. Now it can't rotate. So you've got to break up that adhesion by mobilizing the scapula, get it nice and loose, and then all of a sudden, bam, patient moves, right? And this, the bad part about it, and we'll talk about with adhesive capsulitis coming up, the bad part about adhesive capsulitis is it's one of those where we kind of take the shotgun approach. We throw everything at it and show, see what sticks. And sometimes what will happen is, like, if Diana has adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder, she comes in to see us, we're getting no progress. She goes home one day, takes a hot shower, and she comes in the next day and she goes, I don't know what you guys did, but look at this. I've got full range of motion again. And we're like, that's right. We're really badasses. And in reality, we don't know why it happened. It just happened. It broke up for whatever reason, and now she's got full range of motion again. Um, sometimes that's just the way adhesive capsulitis works, where it just randomly resolves. And we're like, okay. And I can get into all kinds of theory on neuro about that, but I'm not going to get into that and really kind of fry Brooke's brain at this point. I don't want to do that. I will cover this again. Right. Brooke's like, please don't. I will cover this again in the next lecture when we talk about the glenohumeral area. So if you didn't get it right now, we will hit this again on Wednesday, so don't totally freak out yet. What I want you to remember out of today's no, it, in a scat, you're in a kines for scat or for the the the, the glenohumeral joint. So we will get this. What I want you to remember today, if you remember nothing else, the scapulohumeral rhythm is 
two to one. I want you to beat that into your head. Scapular humor rhythm, two to one. Like tonight, you should wake up and be like, scapular humor rhythm is two to one. Inflection and abduction. Good. You get that, we can get the rest later. All right. Oh, get over it, just flew by. So here's that fun term of scapular winging. Anyone get nauseated by these pictures at all? Mm. So scapular winging is when that inferior border of the scapula, for whatever reason, likes to pop out. It pops up and off the ribs, basically. It is pretty painful, right? What muscle helps prevent that, do you think? What muscle would help with protraction? Rhomboids a little bit, good. And then serratus, and a little bit of teres minor. Teres minor does a little bit as well, Diana, not as much as serratus though. For sure, serratus is the big one, right? So for example, none of these, are, I wish I could find the picture of the quarterback that we had in Pennsylvania, but we had this 17-year-old uh, quarterback for York High School that we saw. Um, and he had severe scapular winging. And when I say severe, his scapula would come 90 degrees off of his body when he threw a ball football. So like, if this is his back, when he was throwing the football, his scapula was out here. It is, it's not really subluxation, it's definitely a abnormal kinesiology movement. It's hypermobility, right? And so think about this, if every time he throw that football, his scapula is coming out like this, he comes in and says, man, the middle of my back just hurts every time I practice. Well, it makes sense because all of these back muscles in here are getting just literally ripped apart every time he throws the football. So what we had to work on was a lot of serratus punches, getting that serratus anterior super strong. And when we tested his serratus anterior, he was about a two out of five. He did not have a ton of serratus strength. So serratus had become really weak because of all the time of him doing this. Um, and it was funny because the docs that sent him over to me, you know, they sent him to me because at least I understood football and some of the other people in the clinic didn't, says he wants him to throw 75 passes every time he's in the clinic, working on his form so that he gets that scapula down. What I didn't think about is if he has to throw 75 passes to me, that meant I had to number one, catch 75 passes. And I also had to throw 75 passes back to him. And I'm not exactly a quarterback. Every time he came into the clinic, I hurt so bad because I'm an old man from throwing 75 footballs. But um, we eventually got that scapula kind of locked back down a little bit. And he went on to play for Rutgers. So, I mean, evidently it worked. But the main idea, if you see this on your boards and it's talking about a patient having scapular winging, what I want you to think about is serratus anterior. Okay, what is weak? Serratus anterior. What is weak? Serratus anterior. What is weak? Serratus anterior. That's what I want to kind of beat in your head about that. So here's the muscles of the shoulder girdle. We have the upper, the middle, and the lower traps, right? That kind of form that whole nice trap, what I call the trap diamond, right? Bing, 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 bing. That supports our whole kind of upper back. We also have our little itsy bitsy levator scapula here. We have our rhomboids, and sometimes just be aware, if you get in a clinic that works specifically on shoulders and hands, they will divide the rhomboids into two parts. Does anyone know what the two parts they divided into are? Major and minor. Major and minor, good, right? Good. Now for us in physical therapy, really doesn't matter all that much which one they're working, they both do the same thing. Right, but sometimes it does divide up. And remember though, that rhomboid also lays under that middle trap, right? So you've got middle trap kind of going over it. You've got pec minor, right, up front, and you've got your serratus anterior. Pec minor's here, right, serratus anterior, my saw blade muscle. And then the last one we forget about a lot is this caracobrachialis, which is just a baby muscle. And caracobrachialis is one of our major shoulder stabilizers, right? It kind of assists 
with a little bit of shoulder flexion, but its major job is anterior stabilization of the shoulder. It almost acts as if it's the ACL of the shoulder joint, keeps things from moving too far either way. But again, that serratus is the one that's often weak on a lot of us. And we'll probably, when we test manual muscle testing, so that with the cracker brachialis, it does a little bit, it's a weak shoulder flexor. I don't think Dr. Johnson talked about this one, but mainly it stabilizes the shoulder. Or as, uh, yes, scapular punches, exactly. Or as one of our, uh, Ray from, I think, cohort seven used to say, we're stabilizing the shoulder. Stabilize, stabilize the shoulder. So the good news is with all of these muscles, the only thing you have to remember about them is everything. You should know your origins, your insertions, your actions, and your innovations of all of them. One of the sets of muscles though is not innervated by a peripheral nerve. It's innervated by a cranial nerve. What muscle is that? The traps, good, the traps, right? What, mu what nerve is it innervated by? Accessory. Yes. Now you might ask, why am I talking about this and why would that be important? Let's say I have a spinal cord injury and I have a high level spinal cord injury here. Accessory nerve. Accessory nerve is the, the cranial nerve that innervates your traps. Yeah, it shrugs your shoulders, right? Right? It also does a little bit of retraction as well because you got middle traps there and does a little bit of downward rotation of the shoulder. Why am I saying this is important? Again, if I have a high level spinal cord injury, all these other muscles are knocked out because anything below that injury level usually is knocked out. But no matter what, your patient usually has shoulder shrugging motion because that comes right off the brain comes right out of that cranial nerve. So that's kind of a, a, a neat feature that the human body has built in, is that no matter what, you still have a little bit of shoulder motion, even if you have a really high level spinal cord injury. I don't know, to me, that's kind of neat the way that's built, but maybe it's not as neat when I'm seeing everyone just kind of be like, why are you talking about this, Mr. McKeever? A lot of these nerves or a lot of these muscles are going to be innervated by kind of going from third cervical region down, right? A lot of them are going to be like C5, C3, C4, C5 down to like T2. And that kind of makes sense. So when we, have a, when we talk about spinal cord injuries in a little bit next semester, we're going to be looking at this going, well, what can a patient do if they have a spinal cord injury? And we have to know if you go, oh, if the spinal cord injury is here, the patient has the ability to do this. That's what a lot of your board questions are going to ask you is, oh, well, if you have a spinal cord injury here, what can the patient do? And that goes back to your myotomes. That's all this is. Now, does the upper trap get some innervation from like C4, sure, gets some. But most of it is, comes from the uh, accessory nerve. There's kind of like everything laid over each other, right? So most of our neck muscles and our shoulder muscles go all the way down to T12 when you think about it, right? That, that lower trap goes all the way down to that T12. So it's kind of amazing when you think about that to me at least. So the force couple. This is where we get multiple muscles to create a singular motion. In the case of something like upward or downward rotation, which we just talked about, involves that scapular humor rhythm of two to one. When I get upward rotation of the scapula, my upper traps are gonna pull that way. My lower traps are gonna help pull the spine that way. And my serratus anterior is going to help pull me a little bit forward into protraction so that it all kind of works together and rotates up. There's not just one muscle rotating that shoulder, right? And the reason I say that again is if we have a spinal cord injury, maybe here, well, there could be a problem because serratus anterior may be knocked out. 
if that's the case, they may not get full upward rotation. And that can lead to some major problems because then they're gonna be limited in shoulder range of motion. When we go the other way and we go into downward scapular rotation, the pec minor helps pull kind of this uh, lateral or the lateral aspect of the, sca the scapula down. The rhomboids will help kind of pull at an angle, pull that inferior angle back towards the spine. Right here's my spine. And then levator is going to help pull this up to the north. So it kind of does a whole rotational motion. That's that force couple motion that's going on. It's a bunch of muscles working in concert to work together. Now, the next question I usually get is, how in depth do I have to know this? This is literally as in depth as you need to know it. That is why I chose these pictures. You have to know the three muscles that work together to do both upward rotation and downward rotation of the scapula. Does that make sense? So for upper, it's upper trap, serratus, and lower trap. For downward, it's primary levator, rhomboids, and pec minor. Now, does that mean that no other muscles help? Absolutely not. Uh, there's still some stabilizers and cracobrachialis kicks in a little bit, and there's some other things that go along with that. But these are the three main muscles that work on both these ranges of motion of the scapula. So what do PTAs need to know pathology-wise for the shoulder girl? Well, you need to know pertinent anatomy, kinesiology of the glenohumeral, cromioclavicular, and subscapular thoracic joints. You need to know the basic mechanisms of tissue healing, right? So what happens when a ligament gets torn? That's fine, Brooke. Um, you know that in that acute phase, they need to rest, stuff like that. So what are some basic pathologies you're going to encounter? One of the big ones you guys are going to encounter is what's called subacromial rotator cuff impingement, right? Or this is also known as AC impingement. So AC impingement makes sense of acromial clavicular impingement, right? What this is literally saying is the rotator cuff is getting stuck under the acromion. It's a real common cause of shoulder pain. The tendons of that rotator cuff are really crowded and kind of laid over each other or buttressed and compressed under that caracoacromial arch. And if that area kind of gets some uh, arthritis in it, or maybe you have, there's, so the acromiums there are three different types of acromium. There's a normal acromion that kind of comes out like this. There's a really long acromion that comes out. And then there's one called a hooked. And in a hooked acromion, the acromion kind of looks like that. And when you get that hooked acromion, this hooks right back into all of those rotator cuff muscles that are coming through that space. Yeah, so Joe says, I sprained the AC and tore the rotator cuff. Exactly, right? That's a common thing to happen, unfortunately, Joe, is once you sprain that AC joint, it kind of compresses down on that rotator cuff, and then that rotator cuff tears a little bit later. You're exactly right. A lot of this will occur in patients with overhead sports activities. So what type of patients might have overhead sports activities? Tennis, football, specifically what position? Quarterback, right? What about baseball? What one are we gonna see in baseball? The pitchers, right? Unless they're kind of a sidearm, right? And then, yeah, I saw volleyball. That's a big one, believe it or not. Like, especially somebody that's either, like, I guess the, the front person or whatever, I, whatever the front line people are called, I don't know. Um, but, yeah, it's big. The serving position as well, yeah, it depends upon. And basketball when they shoot, right? You don't think about that a lot because you're like, oh, well, that's not. But, no, when I come here, I'm over my head again. And that really compresses that thing, right? And if you watch the Philly game last night, you can see how bad players are at shooting. Water polo could be, I didn't think about water polo. Good. Swimmers, there's the other one, yep. You have no idea how many people on my Facebook page were posting all kinds of cuss words after last night. Because I'm from Pennsylvania. 
So when we have rotator cuff impingement, we have to, there is a distinction that needs to be made. So I actually didn't think about that. Goalie's in soccer. Maybe he does have impingement. Yeah, John, maybe that's his problem. Again, distinctions with subacromial rotator cuff impingement have to be made between primary and secondary rotator cuff impingement. And what it's saying is we have to be able to determine, is it that acromium that's causing the problem? That would be primary rotator cuff impingement. Or is it that the rotator cuff itself is so swollen because of overuse that it's now impinging on the AC? That would be more of a secondary impingement where it's not actually the AC that's causing the problem. It's more of the muscles themselves or an inflammatory condition of the muscles. Again, primary meaning it's the problem. Secondary meaning it occurs from something else. Glenohumeral instability is a common one, right? Anterior dislocations to the shoulders are more common. And when it says anterior dislocations to the shoulder, it doesn't mean that the arm is going this way. That's not what anterior dislocations to the shoulder mean. It means that the humeral head is going anteriorly. So in the case of a quarterback, it's an excellent example of it, right? When a quarterback steps back to throw, their arm's out here like this. And the defender is taught to attack out here at the elbow, right? Because if I attack out there at the elbow, there's a good chance I'm either going to fumble the ball or I'm going to screw up the pass. But if I attack out there at the elbow, that humeral head is going to go right forward. And that's in a position of subluxation dislocation out here. So it's really common for quarterbacks to dislocate their shoulder. When we have problems like that, we can end up with things called either Bankert or Hill Sachs lesions. So a Bankert lesion is an avulsion of the capsule and glenoid labrum. This is where the capsule itself tears and the glenoid labrum tears off the anterior rim of the glenoid. So if my shoulder pops forward, my, my humerus pops forward, it's gonna rip off the anterior labrum in the anterior capsule. A hill sax, on the other hand, is the opposite. So banker is going forward, is the dislocation. A hill sax is going backwards. So this is usually where the posterior aspect of the humerus smashes into that shoulder in the back. The other term that the book doesn't mention a lot here, but you guys may have heard is, yeah, exactly, just don't write avulsion into Google, if you want to eat, is this. Has anyone heard of that term before in physical therapy? This is not where you yeah. slap a patient. Does anyone know what that abbreviation is for? Superior labrum anterior posterior. Very good. So it stands for superior labrum, anterior to posterior. What that is saying is in a slap tear, I have torn my labrum from the front all the way to the back. Is that gonna create some instability? Oh yeah, right? That's gonna seriously create some instability. So a slap lesion is another common one that we get. And then we have this fun one down here. And I'm going to tell you with Dr. Reskin, do not use that term. Do not use frozen shoulder. She does not like frozen shoulder because she'll say, well, if you touch the shoulder, it's warm. So it can't be frozen. The technical term for it in the physical therapy world is adhesive capsulitis. Adhesive meaning sticky, Capsulitis, capsules inflamed. It's usually characterized by decreased shoulder range of motion, pain, inflammation, all that. It's more common in women affecting patients between the 40 and 60 years of age. But men get adhesive capsulitis too. Usually the men's that I see usually get it after 60. But it can affect anyone. And it's an idiopathic disease. Well, that's a good question. Why do you think a lot of this stuff affects women again? those wonderful hormones, right? And what's happening between 40 and 60 for women? Menopause. Yeah, menopause, right? And so the muscles get a little bit of weak from the, the, the weirdness going on with the estrogen and testosterone imbalance that's going on in your body. 
And so that triggers all kinds of problems with those muscles, right? Menopause is a totally different thing. That's again, when we buy convertibles as guys. So it just causes a little bit more problem with ladies. But that doesn't mean men don't get it. And again, the one thing about adhesive capsulitis is it's idiopathic. Meaning we don't really know why it happens. Um, I've had patients that have gotten adhesive capsulitis by being in the shoulder or being in the shoulder, being in the hospital for an extended period of time. I've had people that get it from sports. So it's not a real rhyme or reason as to why adhesive capsulitis happens. Uh, older patients, usually secondary adhesive capsulitis develop because of limited mobilization. Like I said, hospitalization is a big one. Pain usually occurs at both rest and during activity. That's the big thing that people complain about with that adhesive capsulitis. So like nothing really seems to help it. It's just constantly sore and achy. Um, as the pain, as the condition progresses, pain usually subsides, right? But it will come back. They'll be like, oh, I've been feeling good for a week, but now the pain's back. It's great. Um, a lot of time during the, that acute kind of painful phase, the doc will prescribe something like NSAIDs or an analgesics like Tylenol, or even sometimes they'll give them opiates. But a lot of times they're going to give them intra-articular steroid injections where they put some steroid in because they're thinking, well, maybe it's more of an inflammation issue. So if we inject them with steroids, we can reduce that overall inflammation. And again, steroids are using aren't like the big make you bulky steroids. They're the inflammatory steroids that they're trying to help you with. Oh, I saw John pop up there. What's up, John? Um, could that also be just like um, patients not as active with like plan of care, AGP? Sure. Absolutely. And especially if they're not active, it'll probably get worse. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, especially in, in, adhesive capsulitis does not resolve if they do not do their HET. That's the major thing with this. And you have to convince them that they're like, well, I'm coming to therapy. Yeah, but it's not going to resolve until you do everything you need to do. AC sprains. I think Joe mentioned this or somebody mentioned that they had the AC, right? And maybe that uh, Ben also has it. Good old Ben Simmons. Usually results in a fall on the acromion end where you kind of transfer force backwards. Um, it's graded based upon the degree of injury. So a first degree sprain, usually just a little bit of a stretch. Second degree, you get a pretty decent tear. You get moderate pain and some dysfunction. And then a third degree is when you end up with some real trouble because at third degree, everything tears out. Hold on here a second. My headset was beeping at me. I was trying to figure out why. Scat fractions usually occur from direct trauma. There's not a real reason other than that that scapular fractures would occur. I mean, it's not like I'm going to retract back and get a scapular fracture. Yeah, it's like an ankle. Yep. Yeah, you mean the AC sprains I was talking about, John? Yeah. Yep, it's just like the ankle. Um. When I see a scap fracture, it's usually out at the distal portions because of the weakness of the smaller areas. I, it says here that scapular, the, fra the fracture of scapular body are the most common and demonstrate the highest incidence of associated injuries. I don't think I've seen like an actual body of the scapula fractured ever, except for a guy that took a baseball back to a scapula. He didn't take it, but he took a baseball back to the scapula. Um, we did have a, there was a pitcher, and I don't remember, I want to say it was for the Diamondbacks, or not the pitcher, a, a batter, that got beamed by a baseball, and it fractured his scapula, which, you know, I guess if you get hit with a 90-mile-an-hour fastball, it's probably going to do some bad things to you. Yeah, he, he kind of curled up like that when he did it, hit right on his scapula. He knew he was going to get beamed, and so he kind of like tucked up thinking, well, it's going to be better if I give it a area hit towards back there. And boy, was that a mistake. And let it hit your head. No, just don't let it hit your head either. Just get out of the way. <laughs> uh, clavicular fracture we talked about are the most common, and it's usually really common under men under the age of 25, which is the, uh, again, what I call the hold my beer period of time for men under 25. And then proximal humeral fractures occur as well. So here's the thing. We're going to 
there is no goniometry for the scapular, uh, for the, or sorry, for the, the shoulder girdle. So, yay. We don't ever measure any range of motion of the, the actual shoulder girdle itself. So movement of the scapula. There's gonna be goniometry of the humerus moving, but there's nothing of the actual clavicle and scapula. So we don't have to do goniometry of that. That should make you guys at least feel a little bit better because that would be a nightmare. There's no goniometry you have to remember for that. Whew, right? But there is manual muscle testing and we will do all of these. So we're gonna do a scap uh, abduction with upward rotation, elevation, adduction. What I will say about all of these manual muscle tests that we are going to do, because the muscles are kind of small, and when I say small, there's not a lot of range of motion with them. It is really easy to cramp somebody. So for like one of the manual muscle tests, you put your hand behind your back with your back of your hand on the back and lift off your back. And then somebody pushes your hand down. That is really easy to cramp somebody. So there's not gonna be a lot of force involved with these manual muscle tests. But we'll practice all these and I'll demo all of these coming up probably a little bit tomorrow and then definitely on Wednesday. But this should make you guys happy. I, think I saw Diana's face get all smiley with that, even though she I didn't even have her brought up here. I could just feel her smile. There is no goniometry for the shoulder girdle. <laughs> and he's like, I'm excited to torture my lab partner. Yeah, I gotta get, that reminds me. I gotta work with Dr. Sokel on those lab partners real quick. So that is a true. You said, yep, go ahead. You said no goniometry for the... The shoulder, shoulder girdle. The so, shoulder girdle. So what are we gonna do the goniometry on, you said? The, the shoulder, shoulder itself. So the, 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 the humeral okay. head moving in the fossa. Okay, right? perfect. Because I want to do that. Okay. Yep, the, we're going to definitely do that. That's that's definitely happening. But there's no way that we can okay. do goniometry of the scapula. It's not like we can lay the goniometer on the scapula yeah. and be like, well, it looks like it moves three degrees. We have an estimate about what it moves, but we're not going to measure it. That'd be okay. silly. Um, there are some that actually show goniometry of the clavicle, but I don't know why. You can, there's a one that you actually measure the clavicle when it moves, but yeah, no, we're not going to do that. That's just silly. I'm not having it. All right. That's it for the scapula. The, the, uh, uh, they are on order. So hopefully soon. Um, what's what I was going to say, if any of you would like to sign out a goniometer in case that's something you're interested in or sign out a set of goniometers, I will be on campus on Wednesday morning. Um, from like eight till probably 1130-ish doing anatomy. Feel free to come in. We'll also be on campus the following week as well. If you guys wanna come in and sign out a goniometer, maybe to practice some of this at home, you can come in and sign out some of the loaners we have and then you know bring them back once you get your kind of bone from us. So if that's something you're interested in, feel free to stop by um, if you wanna wait a little bit. Oh yeah, you could return your reflex hammers if you have them. That'd be a good idea, John or anything else you might've borrowed from me. Um, so it wasn't your group, but somebody had my flashcards. I was like, where did my flashcards go? Uh, yeah, Amanda's at a link to some goniometers. It's pretty cheap. Yeah, seven bucks on Amazon's about what they are. So I'm gonna stop recording here.